three weeks of watching her. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, this fish has been an absolute beast. Snagged me up along the tree line for a little while, probably about four or five minutes. Took out another rod and uh, <laughs> finally managed to get him under a bit of control. Thank you, Frimley. Lovely old girl. Let's get the kettle on, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome back to Frimley. Well, the last time we spoke, I was just on a little bit of a blank run and that continued. It continued for about another three weeks. I was coming down doing two nights a week, one night a week, and uh, I broke that recently. I've had a string of fish I'm gonna to talk to you about how I changed my luck and uh, my approach to what I've been doing. I have just set up in this swim, much to Joe's annoyance, got all the gear ready, and I found another fish just along the bank there, a really big fish sitting under a bush. So I'm not gonna waste any time. I'm gonna get my gear packed up, move to the next swim and get some rods out. Then we'll have a little catch up. Okay, so that's the swim move done. I only had to move about 10 yards to the next swim, but it faces a completely different bit of water. And um, what I tend to do here is I was on quite a few fish in that last swim, but when I see a big fish, I have to move on it, and the fish I just saw was huge. So um, I quickly move swims. I've got a rod in close where I saw it, and then I've spread rods just going out so that I'm covering all areas, all bases, if you like. I've got one out in the lake, one in a little silt gully and one on a gravel shelf in the margin. Um, I've had a few fish out of this area recently, so it made sense to move in here seeing one. So what's happened since I last saw you? Well, since I last saw you, I went on a bit of a blanking spree, um, probably racked up about five nights without a fish over the course of three weeks. And um, I knew I had to change something. There hadn't been a bite off the bottom I reckon in a good month, so it was obvious that the fish were using the upper layers to do their feeding, so I began to fish zigs. Now, originally, when I put the zigs on, nothing happened, and um, I'd done a couple of nights fishing zigs with fish all over me, and I couldn't work out why I couldn't get a bite. The next week when I come down, I had some maggots with me, and I noticed some fish on top of a bar, and as they were taking stuff, they were almost taking it off the surface. That made me realise that they were definitely on fly hatches. So I sewed four maggots to the top of a bit of foam just to give it that bit of visual movement, you know, and send out signals down the lateral line as well. Maggots do stink, although we can't smell them very much. I guarantee you the carp can. So I put them zigs out and that really did change the session. Um, I started off a session with a 22 pound common just on dark and then at about half six the next morning I got another bite and had a lovely 32 pound half linear. So on my next session Dan I was super confident on the zig rod. I put the zig out again sewed four maggots to the top of it just with a little bit of floss and a needle went through the top of the foam and just stuck them to the top. That session I had another 20, um, I think I had two 20s that session both again on zigs so things were going really well. Then I came down with Mainline doing a bit of filming. And obviously, Mainline don't want to see me catching fish on zigs, they want to see me catching fish on bait. What I had been doing the whole time I was fishing the zigs was just trickling a bit of bait in. Not loads, sometimes 100 baits a session. Because I think when it comes into that zig season, everyone forgets that the fish will still be feeding on the bottom and it is prime time. It leaves you a little window to establish your bait. So it's exactly what I did. I put about 100 to 200 baits out each session and I knew because of what was going on around the lake that I was probably the only one putting a bit of bait in. Anyway, when it, when it started to warm up and I come down with mainline, the first fish I got was on a zig, which was a 20. Then the second bite come off a very shallow bar, really good scrap and I landed a lovely 39 pound common. 
So now my confidence was back on the bottom. I knew that the bait I'd been slowly introducing was being visited. Next session down, I found some fish under some trees. Um, there was a fish under there that's a really well-known fish in here, one of the 18, the big fully scaled. And it was sat with a little short, fat, dumpy mirror and a long, lean common. And it was easy to see because a lot of the commons in here, you know, they're very deep bodied fish, small heads, big shoulders. But this fish was long and lean, mid 20. And the other fish was so fat, it looked like it was spawn bound. And then the fully scaled just dwarfed the pair of them. But I put some bait in and nothing happened all day. I went and visited the spot a few times and the fish were still there and the bait wasn't touched. The next morning when I went in there, the fish were gone, but so was all the bait and I was convinced it was them that ate it. So I moved into the swim and put a rod down the tree line. I fished all night and when the next morning come along, I've got to admit, I was a bit, you know, um, dejected. I thought, I can't believe that rod didn't go. I've been feeding them fish, you know, for 24 hours and I thought it was going to go. And then just as I was thinking that, the left hand rod has pulled up tight and I've had a really good scrap. And as it's come up and rolled in the net, I recognised it as the short fat fish straight away. So I knew I'd been very close to that big fully scaled. I went home, sorry. The open water rod went that session, so I literally did another night. The tree rod never moved again. The open water rod the next morning, 7am on the dot, went and had a lovely scaly 32 pound mirror. So things were going well. The fish are now visiting the bottom and I've got things rocking a little bit. The next week I've got down, I've come into the area where I see the big fully almost two weeks running and um, there's nothing there. So I fished in another swim for the night and it was freezing cold. There was an easterly wind blowing in my face. The next day the sun come out and I thought I'd just go and check the tree. I'd put about 10 baits in there. When I've looked in there, there's the fully scaled and the skinny common just sat underneath a big branch. I broke up some baits and threw them in, come back half an hour later and both of them, their tails were in the air and they're eating it and I couldn't believe it. So I moved into a swim that gave me a good cast at getting as close as I could to the front of these snags. Got in there, got the rods out, four o'clock that afternoon, the left hand rod's gone round, really good scrap and it nearly got me under the trees and I knew straight away it wasn't that big of because it was way too fast. As it come in the net, straight away I recognised it as the long skinny common. So I knew now out of the trio I'd had two of them and I thought surely I must have been so close to that big fully. I got the rod back out on the snag and instead of putting another rod to open water, I thought I'd just drop a rod about a rod length off the snag because there's a lovely silt gully and I thought the fish are going to be travelling up and down that and I'm sure that she will use it. Got a bit of bait out, not many, about 20 baits. And I just scattered them around the area. It was about six o'clock the next morning, just getting light when the middle rod has pulled up tight and I was on it straight away, lifted into it and it was a typical big fish, slow and dogged, kited out away from the snag, which was lovely. So I took my time playing it and as it rolled in that first light, my first glimpse of the fish, I swore it was a common and I looked, I thought it's a good common, it's definitely sort of 38 plus. As it went down, it come past me and as it come past me, again, I thought it was a common. I've stopped it just before a snag, rolled it over and just slid the net straight under it. When I looked in the net, I was absolutely shocked. So I'm expecting to see a common and I was met with the sight of some massive big golden scales and it was the big fully. I was so excited. It's been a long time since I've jumped and danced around the swim like that, I tell you. But I left her in the net, sorted out the scales and I give her a good 20 minute recovery. Got her out, 44 pounds and four ounces one of the main fish in the lake like I was over the moon she's I think she's about 47 years old this fish and everything you'd want in a carp so absolutely buzzing I've come back down this week with Joe hopefully we're going to catch one it's very cold it's been mad the weather lately we've had hot sunshine and the fish have been on the top and then a few days later we've had an easterly wind and it's been freezing cold and right now it's freezing cold so um we are like hoping for a fish. It's done the odd fish. It's still not fishing its head off. I think in the last week now it's done three carp and there's been an average of four or five anglers on the night, sometimes more. So it's not fishing its head off, 
but we're here and we've been doing all right, so fingers crossed we'll catch another one. If not, check out the footage of the fully. Probably one of the best carp I've ever caught. 44 pound, fully scaled from Frimley. That's about as good as I get. Well done. <laughs> Thank you, my darling. Didn't take you long. Three weeks of watching her. There you go, the move has paid off. 30 pound eight ounces of Frimley Common. And uh, Joe's been coming out of me a little while and I'm always quite unlucky when he comes out of me, but not tonight. Lovely carp. Gave me a massive drop back, went up and then the bobbin just hit the deck. Yeah, lovely scrap. And uh, Frimley 30. It's fishing quite tricky at the moment, so it's nice to get one for the camera. Even though she ain't too happy to see the lights at night. Thank you very much. <laughs> there we go. Mega carp. This fish has been an absolute beast. Snagged me up along the tree line for a little while, probably about four or five minutes. Took out another rod and uh, <laughs> finally managed to get him under a bit of control. And it is a strong old carp seen it roll, it looked like a mirror. Oh. That's it, come round this way, love. Here we go. There he is. And it is trying to be the biggest pain it can be, this fish. <laughs> really strong carp. Oh, 
Come on. He is not a happy carp. Does not want to come in whatsoever. Oh, come off it. My back is killing. My arm's aching. And this fish is still pulling like mad. There it is. Yeah, it's a nice fish. Come on, girl. Keep going. Keep going. Yes. Well. That absolutely battered me, <laughs> and uh, it's a nice fish. Definitely a 30 pounder. Um, never thought it was gonna give up. Snagged me on the bush, tried to go round the corner under the trees, took out a rod, absolute nutcase. I'm gonna give it a good 20 minutes rest after a fight like that, and then, uh, We'll get out and have a look. There you go. This was the culprit of that absolutely mental fight. Just under 37 pounds. Real chunky fish, solid across its back. Really pleased with this one. There's a bit of a fallacy that Frimley is full of commons and in fact it's got a good head of very big mirrors to just under 50 pound so um yeah probably in my opinion one of the best venues in the country at the moment surely because of the age and the size of the fish they don't really come much better than these okay well she's been well behaved on the bank so I'm going to get her back. Yeah, they're all on the bait. Look at that. I was feeding them all day yesterday. They've clearly been eating it. No, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> Come here. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> Come on. There we go. You ready, Joe? Lovely. Thank you, Frimley. Lovely old girl. Let's get the kettle on, Joe. <laughs> okay, so my rods are back out and I'm gonna to talk to you about my baiting approach and how it's changed from the last video we've done. When using the zigs and the maggots on top of the zig, within a, a week or two of using them, the roach started to peck the maggots off the top and that was a good in indication to me to stop crumbing up the bait and to stop putting maggots in it because basically you're going to end up feeding the roach because they become more active as the water warms up. So straight away I'm just chopping baits, I'm chopping them into halves and what I generally do is get me ridge monkey bucket, get off you, and I sit here while I'm fishing, fill up the chopper You'll get about 40 baits in one of these. Always put it flat on something, never put your fingers up the inside because there's a blade in there. Push it down and you're breaking the baits into halves. Now, I've done something that you won't see very often. I've got three different boilies in there. You can see three different colours. And there's a reason for that. If you remember, I spoke about the pellet and different pellets giving off different smells, different oils. This is what I'm doing with my boilies, and it's not something you'll see very often. So I've got three different flavour baits in there, all from mainline, and that is how confident I am in that bait. I know it all works, and the fish will get used to finding this mix of bait. 
If you think of a busy syndicate, on spots you're fishing, the fish will often come across two or three different types of bait on a spot. That can actually be deemed as safe because people have come and gone. So I use three different baits, three different flavours, and they're all covered in smart liquid, and that is filling the water column, and it makes a really attractive area. I've cut out the crumb and the maggot because of the silver fish, and I'm just fishing halves and holes. And luckily, on Frimley, there is the odd swim that's 20 wraps, but most of them are between 10 and 12 wraps fishing. So it's really easy to bait, nice and accurately. Especially things like the snags and tree lines, you can just walk in, sprinkle a few baits in, and get the fish going on your bait. And proof in this was the amount of bait that that fish was passing, they've really been on it. And uh, we're still early in the year. It is actually late April, feels like March. It's still very cold. Me and Joe are both sitting here in winter coats, but um, the fish are definitely on the feed. The light levels are really long. It's getting light at six o'clock and it ain't getting dark till about half seven. And that is a good indication to the carp that it's time to feed. You know, the water is warming up slowly. It's getting a lot, of, a lot more sunlight on it and things are waking up and the fish are definitely feeding. So that's how my tactics have changed. I'm gonna go and put some bait in now and uh, we'll have a look at a few spots. What I like to do, I can see the obvious spots the fish are using. And obviously I'm still 10 feet away, landing on the outskirts of these branches. So I like to spread a little line of bait all the way so they can follow it out. And it's only a lot of bait, it's probably 50 baits cut in half. And uh, as the day goes on and the sun comes up, the fish will move into here and the bait is already there. They're just getting used to finding the bait everywhere all the time. And it's nice to just come and stand here, lean against the tree. And if you're here for an hour or so, generally you'll see one slide in. And this is where I saw the big fully scaled a couple of weeks ago, which gave his location away. There's a lot of trees on this lake like this where you can stand and watch and um, gives you a really good idea of the fish you're fishing for if you want to target a particular carp. You have to be a little bit careful when climbing trees. About two weeks ago I was on this particular tree and I fell off into the lake. <laughs> it's funny now but it wasn't at the time. It was freezing cold, I fell into the lake about four foot deep, freezing cold, still stayed. <laughs> I'm just winding in. I've baited that tree line and um, basically I want to allow them fish to move in and out of that now. And sometimes having a line along it, that can prevent the fish or spook them from the area. So if you've got the chance and you are on a two night session, when you're outside of bite time, like I am now, bite time's gone, I'm quite happy to pull the lines in and give the swim. I'm going to rest this swim now five hours. I'm not going to put a line out in here. Me and Joe are going to go and have a look at the stock ponds and the other lakes at Frimley. We're going to get back this afternoon, talk a bit about rigs, then get the rods back out. Swim's lovely and rested. It's had food in it. So if they did feed, they're free to do what they want and it gives them a full sense of security and that's where you want them and hopefully we can catch another fish and things are looking really good. Now if you look over at that top corner, that's where Nigel Sharp's house, that is. <laughs> Nigel used to live there. Not no more, poor sod. <laughs> Yeah, so you see this morning when we was talking about the stock in Frimley, there is a lot of old fish in there and they really are in the prime of their lives. But Frimley has an ongoing program to stock the lakes and it's mad. One stock pond here, you've got um, lake free fish. When they've bred, they've put them in and they've got them up to eight or nine pounds. In here, you've got line I'm sorry, leanies. So you've got pr proper pure leanies in here, which eventually will be grown and you've got lake three, lake four fish. When the fish spawn, they bring them, up, they bring them over to here. They're grown on. 
and subsequently in years time will be released back into the lakes. So they're keeping that same strain going back into the lakes, which is quite unique. You know, them small head, high backed commons, them beautiful scaly mirrors. They're all here. I came here the other week when we were netting it and some of the fish in here that Mark has bred on from the lakes are absolutely unbelievable. But um, yeah, it's excellent. This is what you've got to do if you want future in your fishing, you know? And they're all fenced to keep the uh, cormorants out and things like that, so the fish are very safe. But yeah, excellent. The future is bright at Frimley. Got it off before it hit bottom. And you won't get it in a better place than that. Okay, so let's tie my version of the Ronnie rig. I'm gonna pull off probably 12 inches, maybe a little bit more with this Camo X25. Cut it off, give yourself plenty. And I'm not stripping anything off this, so I want it to maintain slightly stiff properties. First thing I'm gonna do is tie my swivel on. And the reason you do that first is so you can get a smaller knot. So you put your, your swivel on. This is one of the rotator swivels. Simple figure of eight. If you do tie that figure of eight with a slightly too big a knot, just knead it down in your fingers until it's the right size. Pull it nice and tight. Snip off the excess. There's your loop. Then the other end of this boom, you're gonna put an anti-tangle sleeve. This one is a tungsten short. Sometimes I do use the long. Now I'm using these quite long, about nine inches. Again, at the other end, you just want a figure of eight. Keep it nice and neat. Pull it down. Uh, where's my pulling? I can't find my pulling tool, so I use my bait needle. There you go. And that is your boom section done. And what you've got to remember, once you've got this boom section, you can actually use this for more than one fish, because after this, you're just going to be changing your hook if you need to. So that's my boom section done. All I need to do to that is add a little bit of putty, which is gonna hold my pop-up down. I'm not too bothered about critically balancing a pop-up. I want it to sit flat on the deck from the putty. There we go, just roll that round, get a bit of heat in it and it'll mold round your knot absolutely lovely like so then you're going to take your hook your hook is a size six medium curve apex and you can see they're stupidly sharp from the pack they're one of the sharpest hooks i've ever used to this you're going to add your rotator sleeve now they can be a bit fiddly so what you've got to do is go in straighten it up and just come through the end like so. That went very smoothly. Now all you're gonna do with that is add it, and I like to go so the hook point faces away from the bend. Little bit of spit to help it come down. And just knead it down over the swivel eye, like so. It's nice and neat. Then you take your mini ring swivel, you put that onto your hook, then you take your hook bead. My advice, if you're getting like me and your eyes are knackered, leave the hook bead on the actual system because it's easier to find your way through. And then you pull that on, set it around the top like that. And what you can do, you can have a pack of hooks 
where you've made up several Ronnies ready to go. So there it is, there's your boom system, your Ronnie rig, your, your sort of eight to nine inches of Camo X, and it's a mega effective rig. It can be picked up from any direction and it can be fished on any bottom. It's supple, you ain't fishing that super stiff boom that everyone puts on a Ronnie, and it absolutely works spot on. All you want to do after that is add your two little quads or your pop-up, your fancied hook bait, and you're ready to go. And like I say, you'll have, I normally got five or six hooks ready to go, so if I have a fish, I'll simply change it over and I'll use the same boom section for probably seven or eight fish. So there you go, super effective rig. We'll hook a fish from any angle that it comes and sucks it up, and the exact same rig as I had the big fully on last week. brings us to the end of another 48 hour session with Carpology and uh, I've had to put up with Joe trying to steal my dog and all sorts this session but we've got a couple of fish 30 pound common and a 36 12 mirror we couldn't ask for more than that last night was very quiet I did feel confident of another bite but the lake become busy and you've got to remember that with syndicates as they get busy the fish will react unnaturally they move into areas where there's no pressure and that's exactly what they did last night we're gonna come back later in the year. It's still quite chilly at the moment, as you can see. Hopefully next time you see me, I'll be in shorts and t-shirt and we'll be trying to catch one off the top. And I may have some more fish to show you and be one step nearer to one of the really big fish in the lake. Ooh.